we just go through some chapters that a lot of people struggle with, but I, I love these chapters and we found some great things to talk about, whether it be uh, the light and, and connections with the Ark of Noah, the, the light and the barges of the brother of Jared and the journey to the promised land, and uh, or it be um, secret combinations. I think we are able to make sense of some insanity and craziness in the book of Ether. Hello and welcome back to The Scriptures Are Real. I'm your co-host, Lamar Newmeyer, and this is my regular host and uh, and co-host also, Carrie. Ah, it's good to be with you again, Lamar. Back in the saddle again. I know, it's been a little while, but um, like I say all the time, you guys have so many great guests on here. I'm happy to share microphones with all these people that are adding to the conversation. Today, we are talking about Ether 6 through 11 in the Come Follow Me manual, and these are, there's some great things in here. We're going to hit a few things. We're going to talk about the ships. We're going to talk about how the people become prosperous, and we're going to hit secret combinations and a little bit of that. And we're going to we're going to um, to try to dive into like we said before in, in in our podcast. We like to to focus on certain elements. We're not going to cover all the things uh, in these ones in these uh, these episodes, but we try to hit one or two or three things that might help the scriptures become real to you and be able to connect. With those um, with those elements in there that make the people and the places real to you, so that you can find yourself in the scriptures and be able to draw that power out of these people relied on the spirit, and we need to rely on the spirit, and we're going to connect ourselves through the scriptures. So we're going to talk about those now, Carrie. Before we uh, before we get started here, now this is actually happens uh, earlier on in Ether. It's in uh, it's either chapter three, uh, I believe. Um, it talks about um, the brother of Jared going to the uh, to the Lord, and he's bringing these stones before the Lord to give him light. There's they're going to be in this really interesting ship where it's pretty tight and there's not a lot of light, so they want to be able to see there. So he brings the stones there. Now we mentioned this before three years ago. We were talking about Noah's Ark in uh, in Genesis, right? Yeah. That when we, we were mentioned this. just starting this whole podcast thing. Exactly. We were just going through this, and we mentioned this. So um, we talked about the, the, where did, where did uh, the brother of Jared get this idea to bring the stones to the Lord? Yeah, and, and it's in chapter 3, like you said, but it becomes a, a, an important thing in today's reading as well, in chapter 6, because it keeps talking, well, it talks about their need for the light, and they have the light in the barges. So I think it has a direct tie-in that we'll want to get to, but you, you're right. That's the question. Like, is this an original thing to him? And maybe it is. Maybe he just came up with this idea, but he may have been getting it from earlier ideas, right? Right. Well, the answer is, I, I don't know, but I do know that the Lord expects us to put our homework in. So here's what I want to get to. And again, it's outside our, our scripture section for today, but I wanted to bring this in because it's going to come into our discussion. So when the Lord wants us to, or gives us a problem, he doesn't leave us alone, but he does expect us to do our research, our homework. He said to Oliver Cowdery, you know, when Oliver Cowdery wanted to, to translate and wanted to be part of the, the, the bringing forth of the Book of Mormon, he tries to do some things and he's not able to do it. And the Lord says in the Doctrine and Covenants to study it out in your mind. So he expects us to do some homework first. Now, we don't know what, how, how the brother Jared came up with this. But I, we do know that he put in some work. He didn't just say, Lord, give us some light. Make a lantern for me. Make it appear right here. He did some homework. And he took some time to melt down some stones and make them into glass. So there's some. he put some work into that. that it's not like you just go out in the backyard and grab some stones and turn them into glass. You've got to smelt them and do all that kind of thing to make it. So he did some homework. He put in some effort to solve this problem. He said, I have a problem, Lord. This is my solution. And the Lord says, oh. Well, okay, let's work with that. Now, what I'm going to suggest here is, and I, we don't know what this is, but if you look back at our, our episode from the week of January 31st, and that'd be 19, uh, 2022, Two, I think, or one, yeah. was it one? I think it's 20, oh, maybe. Was it 20, I think it's 2022. 2022, 23, 24. Yeah, so it would be 22, I guess. January, or, or no, actually January 31st, so it would have been the uh, 22, uh, 23. No, no, it's Old I, no, Testament. I don't know. So 22 is Old Testament, 23 was New Testament, 24 is Book of Mormon. So, yeah. There you go. The problem is back then we didn't have episode numbers. 
We had episode names until we finally said, hey, we should probably put some numbers on these things. It'll be easier to find. So it's called Noah's uh, Noah, the Ark, and Perfection. And Noah's Perfection, week of January 31st. In 18 minutes and 34 or 18 minutes and 45 seconds, we talked about this concept. So if you want to go back and check it out, that's where you can go here. This maybe we can put in the show notes too. In that discussion, we talked about Genesis chapter six. In verse 14, he talks about, uh, we're talking about Noah, like the original Noah, Noah in the ark. He takes and uh, makes an ark of gopher wood and he makes rooms in the ark and he fashions it after this way and the length shall be 300 cubits and the breadth, so forth. In verse 16, he says, a window thou shalt make in the ark and a cubit uh, shalt thou finish above it. Now that word window is unique. And maybe you're, you know uh, Hebrew much better than I do, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about the word for that word window there. And if you look in the LDS scriptures, it has a little A next to it, a footnote there. And if you look at that footnote, it will tell you that it says Hebrew, Sohar, some rabbis believe it was a precious stone that shone in the ark. Yeah. And Hugh Nibley is really the one that, that pointed this out. So, the word that is typically used for windows is chalon. Um, and th there's another word that can be used sometimes that's kind of like a, a lattice work that gets used in the in Genesis 7. But um, th this tzohar is used here, translated as window. It's never really used as window. Um, we don't know. So if you were to go to most uh, Hebrew lexicons, they would say that the meaning is dubious. Uh, but mm -hmm. we know it's somehow associated with light, uh, even perhaps light at midday or at noon, meaning a bright light. Uh, so it's it's less a window and more a light. There's some kind of bright light that is shining in the ark. And, and as you said, rabbis have thought, well, what else could that be than a stone that somehow glows uh, before you get to LED lights? So... Um, <laughs> That it's just because it's so odd and it's so associated with light that we've made that jump. Who knows exactly what it is, but uh, that does seem, as as you Nibley pointed out, seem remarkably similar to what we're reading about here. Yeah. So that's this is what I'm going to base my whole testimony on that that this is that these things, but these are the little connections that I find that make this podcast fun for me to do with you. Is we find little things like this that that connect us in, and we find little treasures and gems or glowing stones that make it fun for me to go, Oh, this is interesting that this maybe, I don't know for sure, but maybe the brother Jared already had this in mind and like, Hey, this was done before he was searching the scriptures and he thought this is a good way. And I'll bring this to the Lord. Now, I don't know if that's hundred percent for sure or not, but it is an interesting connection. But either way we credit the brother Jared for doing his homework whether he got it from the scriptures or from Noah, or he just decided this is the way sounds good to me to have a glowing stone and I'll make, I'll ask the Lord to touch him. Either way, he did some homework. So I want to, that's kind of my theme here for this is that hard work brings forth rewards. Even if we don't know what that's going to be like, or we're going out on a limb, um, we need to do our homework. We don't just want to ask the Lord like, Hey, drop this in my lap. I have a problem, solve it for me. And I'll follow that. We need to put some put some sweat into it. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. It's it's it is a cool little connection. So anyway, that's verse that's uh, chapter three, and I just wanted to get that away because, like I said, we've been doing this for a while now, and that's three years ago we came up with the same thing, and and I I think I said back then even though we'll we'll cover this in, when we get to ether in a couple of years, but if you go back to uh, eighteen minutes in, you'll see our discussion there, and it's kind of a fun thing to to revisit that and say, ah, we're coming full circle. Okay, so anything you want to add? Anything you have to? No, that's. I mean, this uh, we can just jump in. This is a wild yeah. and woolly set of readings. I mean, chapter six is kind of the end of the story that was all of last week, uh, but uh, the rest of this reading is crazy. When I teach this in my classes, I wear my Looney Tunes tie. Uh, because if, <laughs> it's it's just uh, this is wild west kind of uh, hunting wabbits kind of stuff uh, that uh, has a, a surprising amount of lessons in it. There, a lot of people, uh, even my colleagues at BYU, these, this isn't their favorite stuff to teach. But I love teaching this stuff because I think if you're willing to pay the price, 
uh, there are incredible gems and incredible lessons in here. So maybe what's easiest is if we do chapter six a little differently, and then we get into the the wild cycle stories. Yeah, let's let's do that. And I wanted to ask you, it's interesting, and I don't know if you covered this um, uh, last week or not. I, I haven't heard the episode yet. But the uh, but it's interesting that Aether shows up at all here. Now, we know it's way back where they find the plates. It's back in Mosiah where they find these yeah. plates. And, and then Mormon goes and compiles most of this. And then it's actually Moroni. Moroni is the one that's inserting this here. Yeah. He's taken over for his father. And he's, we're not even to Mormon and Moroni the books yet. And Moroni pops up and he's like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the, this record in here. Now, why do you think... That Moroni puts it in here instead of an, I don't know, did they have appendices back then? Or? Uh, yeah, Why well, it almost it is in? like an appendix, right? Um, it's It does seem like, so we get at the end of of the small Book of Mormon, right? Mormon's Book of Mormon. Um, Moroni is the one who's writing there and he's telling us, I don't know anyone, I, I'm alone. I'm so alone and I've got these plates and my father's written what needs to be written and I'm just writing a little bit. And he actually gives a kind of a farewell at the end of that. Right. Uh, and then it seems to me like he says, well, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> so what am I supposed to do? And uh, <laughs> I, I should do something good. And and really all the good he can do is in this writing, because other than that, he's hiding. He's not interacting with people. So he's, uh, it, it's in writing to future generations because there's no one for him to talk to. Uh, and try and uplift or help. So it seems to me that he's probably asking the Lord what he should do, and this is the answer he gets. Uh, give us an abridgment of an abridgment, right? So the, the plates that Ether made, Ether is like the Jaredite Mormon. He's made an abridgment of all their records. And then Moroni gives an abridgment of an abridgment, which gives us like this super fast forward uh, you know, five times uh, listening speed kind of thing uh, with the the book of uh, Ether. And it's uh, it's a, a great kind of overview of everything we've learned so far in the Book of Mormon. Let's let's get it again in an overview fashion. Yeah, like like you mentioned, um, it almost sounds like he seals up the book and I wouldn't maybe he already sealed it up and put it away thinking he's not going to touch it again, you know, because it, it's all, it's like a farewell and the, my father and the whole thing. Yeah. He and certainly like, thought he was done. Right. Yeah. Then you, you almost hear like the money by I'm not dead yet. Yeah. So yeah. he, he comes up and better. Like, I feel, I think I'll go for a walk. That's right. So he goes and, and, and he comes back and I'm like, well, there's, there's some things to put in there. And so you wonder if he wasn't reading through the, the record and just thinking, you know what? I've got these records here. I should put these in here. But you, like you said in a minute, we're going to get to the faster. Like there's a, he talks about the brother Jared. He goes through, um, you know, their, their life and the brother Jared. And then he, they get to the land and then they prosper. And then, poof, then we're off to like, I, I can't even remember how many generations. It's like 14, 15 generations yeah. that they, that they speed right through. And um, so let's let's get to that. So you you mentioned chapter six. Go ahead. Why don't you uh, take us through chapter six first, and then we'll get to some speed reading. Yeah, we don't have time to cover everything, but I think that that the journey we've spent last week uh, all this time talking about an archetypal journey, this notion that we can find ourselves uh, journeying to the true promised land in the same way that the Jaredites are journeying to the promised land. And but but the reading doesn't get to the part where they get to the promised land. So that's this week. Right. Um, and uh, it's it's kind of fun that uh, you've got this journey they're on. And it, it really does highlight at the beginning of the journey that he gets the stones and he puts them in the vessels and the Lord causes the stones to shine in darkness to give light unto men. And I love this. If we're going to think about this in terms of the journey. Uh, Jared or Mahan Rai or Mari Ankmer or whatever his name is, I think it's Mari uh -huh. Ankmer, but anyway, um, he just doesn't want his people to go on a journey in darkness. And I don't want my people to do that either. Right. Uh, uh -huh. but, uh, the interesting thing to me, so that's, I think, I think the light is a, there's some great symbolism in there. That's worth all of us thinking about how do we ask God to give light to our families? But uh, maybe the, the highlight to me of this voyage is they get in there, they cork themselves in, as it were, and, yes. uh, and then they travel 
to the promised land by wind, but not by sail, just no. by waves, really. At least uh, it doesn't mention any sails, right? No, no. There, I, I think there can't be sails because yeah, the, there the way it describes it. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So you were talking about that earlier. Why don't you yeah, let's talk so, about what this must be like? Yeah. You know, look, I've looked around at, at other people and I'm like, does anybody have any idea what these are like? And we just don't have enough information. But I have a little bit of engineering background and I want to know someday I want to look back to the tapes or maybe there'll be a museum that we can look at these. I want to see what these things look like. Now, it's clearly established they're tight like into a dish. We say 88 times they're tight like into a dish. But what does that mean? Yeah. I don't know. These are these are the craziest vessels I've ever heard of. Because if you have air holes top and bottom, I don't know how that works, man. I mean, are you is, is one day you're, you're sealing the top and one day it's the, the floor? And are you just in a hammock rolling around the whole time? Is it is it like a giant rock tumbler that you're just in there with all your stuff? I mean, you're it's got to be You're great. in your drying I, machine, right? I'm pretty sure that if the Lord is mindful enough to allow them to have light, that they would have figured out some other things. So maybe this was a nice cushy ride. I don't know. But it doesn't sound comfortable to me. They're no. tossed about in the waves. And they had, there's eight boats. So how do you keep eight boats together? Yeah, and they can't Look, talk to each other at all the whole time. Well, I mean, is there times when you can uncork your hole and you yeah, get up on top and, and, and talk to me? But listen, if you've ever been, if, if anybody knows about boating, you tie boats together, well, they'll bang into each other and they'll yeah. bust out. So how does this work? I don't know how this works. I just know that I want to see how the, the engineering works. I, I believe what is said here. And we know they're tightened to it like into a dish and they have some corks and they do this. And the, yeah. But I really want to know how this is. And this is one of the things I want to watch. I want to watch on... Uh, on, on DVR up there or whatever. Yeah, I want to yeah. figure out or, or see the museum or the replay. This is a, a fascinating thing. And the Lord is, a, a, this is absolutely amazing to me how these people get here. Yeah. I in mean, these, you have to places. ask, did they have their, uh, their food in a box that was tied to the side so that whichever way was up, they could get to it. And they had like their, their bedroll, one tacked on the ceiling and one tacked on the floor. So whichever way, you know, I don't know. I like the like, rock tumbler Im image. They're but. like they're like astronauts in this thing. They're like in yeah. this thing, and then sometimes they're buried in the waves. Now I don't think they're total submarines. I don't think it's that, but I it, it does say several times they were tossed upon the waves before the wind in verse five in chapter six that many times buried in the depths of the sea yeah. because of a mountain of waves which broke upon them. Uh, man, I'm telling you, it, they, I hope they have some good Dramamine or some version of that. Because yeah, that's the other thing, right? <laughs> this does not sound like a comfortable journey. And it's not short. 344 days. Yeah. That's just shy of a year that you're in this dryer <laughs> rolling around with your... I don't know. Look, I don't want to be too light about that. I, I just know that, that the Lord uh, prepared this for them, and maybe it was a nice cushy ride and maybe it's like oh it was great it was like a submarine and we had these chairs that were, i don't know what it's like but it was must have been awesome but i also and, think and remember they, they also have animals and yeah. bees and stuff and how does that work you <laughs> don't know I, just going around how did the how are the bees surviving do they have plants in there then what 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 is this like i don't know i don't uh, know but it, it's got to be one crazy journey I wonder if Moroni wondered that too. And he's like, I don't know. But all we know, we, we just know it's tied like to a dish and they have some lights. And then they get there. So, okay. Yeah, so. I want to talk a little bit about the getting there, just some of the symbolism. And I'm not the first one to have come up with this idea. And I've even heard people talk about it in general conference. I, I can't remember who I probably should be diligent and look that up. But I just want to talk about the thoughts I've had a, a, about it for a while. That uh, verse five, it came to pass that the Lord God caused that there should be a furious wind blown upon the face of the waters toward the promised land. And then we get into all the stuff you were just reading about, the mountain waves and so on. But we go down to verse 8. Um, well, and, and it is worth noting in verse 7 that uh, it, they even compare it to Noah's Ark. And they say, therefore, when they were encompassed about by many waters, they did cry unto the Lord and they did bring them forth again upon the top of the waters. They're like, okay, the, the air is getting pretty stale down here. This may <laughs> not be so healthy. Can we go up for air? But yeah. Verse 8 and it came to pass that the wind did never cease to blow towards the promised land while they were upon the waters, and thus they were driven forth before the wind. And and uh, I think that's incredible. The, the thing that is making their life hard, that's the wind and the waves it creates, is mm -hmm. also the thing that's driving them to the promised right. land. And if we're going to have this archetypal journey where we're thinking of the promised land as the true promised land and the celestial kingdom, then what it means 
is the things that are driving us towards being celestial beings are things that are hard. They're, they're tempests, they're mountain waves, they're things that toss us about to and fro. And, uh, and it, that's not easy, but it is what we want because we do want to get driven there. What these guys may have felt like is, can we just have some peaceful, calm water? But that means they'd just be on the ocean for forever. They wouldn't get right. to the promised land. We don't want peaceful, calm water. Maybe every now and then we want to pray and say, let me have some, uh, just take a breath for a minute. But sure. if we want to get to the celestial kingdom, we're going to be blown by the wind, never ceasing to blow us towards the promised land with mountain waves coming and everything else. And note in the middle of all of that, verse nine, they did sing praises unto the Lord. Yea, the brother of Jared did sing praises unto the Lord. And he did thank and praise the Lord all day long. And when the night came, he did not cease to praise the Lord. And thus they were driven forth. Right. That's uh, that's amazing to me. That he's, he's just like, this is wonderful. <laughs> the sheep lands on him. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, a bee flew in my mouth. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, oh, where did my food go? It's on the floor. It's on the ceiling. Wait. Uh, oh, thank you, Lord. Right. I, I don't know what this was ex exactly like, but uh, he is praising the Lord. The entire time, despite the difficult, and I think this had to have been a somewhat difficult journey, as you said, for almost a year. Uh, and and you can get a little bit of it when you get to verse 12. And they did land upon the shore of the promised land. And when they had set their feet upon the shores of the promised land, they bowed themselves down before the face of the land and did humble themselves before the Lord and did shed tears of joy before the Lord because of the multitude of his tender mercies over them. They are happy to be there safe, and I think they're happy to be there, to, to, to be done with this difficult journey. That'll be us one day. I, I love that. And I think that there, you've heard the phrase before, or we've heard the phrase before, the joy in the journey. Yeah. Well, they were able to find the joy in the journey. They were singing praises. And, you know, I don't know if that was 344 days of the Tabernacle Choir the whole time, but... <laughs> But the point is, is they kept a good attitude about it and that we have to find the joy in the journey. Look, uh, we're here to learn lessons and learn. And you don't do that without some difficulty. That's what it is. I, I used to tell my seminary students all the time, look, if you want to get big muscles, you have to stress them. Yeah. You're stressing those muscles and you're tearing, you're making little micro tears in those muscles that they'll grow back. Well, yes, we have to be stressed. We have to be stressed in some way at some time. We're not meant to be lounging upon, you know, pillows while people feed us grapes. That's not the point of this life. We got to do it. And you're right. We need to have some peace, but we need to, the part of it is the attitude that they had about it. They sang praises and they were, they gave gratitude. I mean, get out of this tumbler and you're like, oh, oh. first of all, you throw up and then you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> that was something. So yeah. anyway, yeah. but they, they're tender mercies. So if, if being in that tumbler was a tender mercy, I mean, it was better than where they were. And um, so anyway, yeah, I, I love I love that thought that we have to we have to find that we have to the, the, the brother Jared kept the attitude and, and he kept uh, he kept the faith and they made it here. And then they thank the Lord. First thing he did, they land and they thank the Lord. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, OK, so now in verse 14, now we're going to get a speed up. Now we, we learn a few things. Uh, Brother Jared had four sons, and they were called Jeremy, you know, Gilgal, Meha. So it lists them off, and then they walked humbly. And so we have some time where they, they start to prosper. And this, again, we we see the pride cycle, right? Happens over and over, and we see it in our own society. They're, they're prosperous, and things are going well for them overall, right? Right. At least for a period of time. Yeah, for, for, for a good while. Um, yeah. you've got that, that generation, it seems like the next generation and, and, uh, part of the next generation. So that's, that's a good while. That's probably close to a hundred years, something like that. Right. So they have some, uh, yeah, a generation in there somewhere, but now look in verse 24, but Jared said to his brother, suffer them that they may have a King. Therefore he said to them, choose you from among our sons whom you will. But now there's a, there's a mention before that. Um, no, let me, let me back up a little bit. Uh, verse 21, it came to pass that they did number their people, that after they had numbered them, they did desire of them the things which they should do before they went down to their graves. So this is their, at the end of Brother Jared or Mohanre Moriankum or whatever his name would be. And uh, 
And Jared, they're, they're about ready to go. What do you should do? And it came to pass people decided they should anoint one of their sons to be king over them. Now here we have this thing again. The same thing happens um, back at the end of Nephi where they're like, you know, give us a king. And they're like, no, you don't want a king. Kings tend to corruption. It, and why, Carrie, what do you think? Why, I mean, we talk, when we listen to the scriptures, we hear things in terms of kingdom and kings and queens and things like that. So it sounds like the kingdom of God is set up to be a kingdom. Why do we not want a king? That's a, it's a great point. And, and we have heard that, you know, it's uh, in the Book of Mormon that if we could have righteous kings, that it would be a good thing. Uh, here is the issue, I think. It is that if you have righteous kings, when we are still largely fallen beings, it's pretty hard to stay a righteous king, to keep a godly view of what leadership means. Uh, it's it's hard. A kingdom is fantastic when you've become godly. Being a king or a queen, uh, ruling over with, with, with dominions that flow to you without compulsory means. Well, the reason they do that is because you've become godly, and then you can do things very well. But when you're still dealing with uh, the temptations of your fallen nature, the odds are you give in to that. That's that's great, and that's true. That tyranny, um, concentrated power, tends to lead toward tyranny. Yeah, and this is. I know that all not all of our uh, our listeners are here in the United States, um, but this has kind of been the the way the, the United States was was founded on decentralized power. Yeah, for this reason, so that it wasn't concentrated in one thing, and the fact that here in America, yeah, here balance in United, of power, we often talk about, it, right? Exactly. Yeah, the balance of power, so that it's not concentrated in one person. And here in the United States, it drives me nuts when I hear about them talking about, well, the president's going to do this. Listen, the president is not supposed to be the king. He's not the pharaoh. The sun doesn't rise and fall. I mean, you know, rising because of the the pharaohs there. The Nile doesn't come. He's, that's not his job. His job, he has specific jobs enumerated in the Constitution, and he's not supposed to be the king. So stop looking at him like he's going to make all your dreams come true. That's not his point. That's not his job or her job. But the point, and this is why we don't want to look in, in the United States, we don't want to have the president be our king. We don't want a king in this case because concentrated power tends to lead towards tyranny. And that's what he says at the beginning here in Ether, Ether 6, um, 21 or 22 uh, or 23 says, behold, uh, brother Jared said, surely this leadeth into captivity. But you're right. It says that in the Book of Mormon, that if they were to hearken unto the word of God, if they were to listen yeah. and they were to, to put God first, then kings would be okay. But that doesn't seem to be the way things go. Yeah. And we have a and, couple of examples of that in the Book of Mormon and it's in the Book of Ether. And it's great. And in the Bible. It's great when you've got a righteous leader, but oh, it's yeah. hard to keep leaders righteous. And all you have to do is look at the beginning of kingship in the Old Testament to see you've got three great leaders and none of them, right, that you've got Saul, David, and Solomon, none of them make it towards the end of their reign without having been corrupted by their power. That's right. That's right. And Benjamin, and King Benjamin, mm -hmm. he's a pretty good king, but he seems to keep it down to earth because he works with the people. He's like, look, I'm not putting grievous taxes on you. I'm not living. I'm work. I'm out here working with you. Yeah. So it seems to me that he somehow grasped the idea that he's not supposed to be sitting in the throne again, eating grapes or whatever. He's out there working with them. So somehow he's maintained that balance of power um, and it didn't corrupt him, but okay. So, but it, here in verse 20, uh, let's see. Um, in verse 24, Brother Jared suffered that they should have a king, and therefore he said, and choose you from the four sons. And most of them say, I don't, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I, I pass. And so anyway, but finally a king is established. Um, came to pass, and neither the sons of Jared, save it were one, or, or Raiha, was anointed king. So most of them passed on it. They didn't want the job. But Arihah does was appointed king, and he reigned and began to prosper, and they became exceedingly rich. In verse 28, they became exceedingly rich. So here's the beginning of our pride cycle, or maybe we're at the 6 o'clock of the pride. So I'm not sure where the rich part is, but if you want to, they, they were doing the right things. They were doing the right things, both seems to be spiritually they were doing the right things, and they were they were walking humbly. Because it says right here in verse 30, and it came to pass that Arihah did walk humbly before the Lord and remembered how great things the Lord had done 
for his father and also taught his people how great things the Lord had done for their fathers. That's the key. He seems like a good king because he's walking humbly and he's teaching correct principle. Right. Agreed? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So that's the king. Well, it doesn't take long. I don't know. It, it's hard to tell. He begat sons and daughters. And he, this is in, in uh, chapter 7 now, verse 2. He begat, third, uh, he begat sons and daughters, and yea, he begat 30 and 1, among whom were 20 and 3 sons. So he's a prolific person. <laughs> yeah. He has that, uh, that, lots that of family. That likely means he has more than one wife. Could, it could be. And also, I don't know if Maybe this they is just also lived a about, long time. <laughs> it could be. It could it also be that he they're talking about sons and grandsons? Because, you know, sometimes they talk about my yeah. father and sometimes they're, they're talking about yeah. multiple. But anyway, I'm not sure yeah, exactly that, how that, that is. That could be as well. But they don't, they talk about concubines and, and how that's not good, uh, yeah. uh, wives and concubines. And yeah. for those of us following along the Book of Mormon, Jacob says the same thing. In Jacob, he says, we should only have one wife uh, unless it's commanded otherwise by the Lord, save it, he need to uh, to raise up a seed unto himself. That's a different story. So yeah. anyway, they look like they're they're doing well, and now begins the, the Looney Tunes thing that you were talking about. It's It yeah. starts here in chapter 7, verse 4 or so. So you want to add in some things there, Kerry? Yeah, well, maybe we can look at this like big picture view. It, 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 we won't have, I mean, we could have some fun, but it won't be maybe, I, it, we can get bogged down if we just go through every single name and, you know, I, it, it require our audience to be ready for the quiz at the end of every single name <laughs> and so on. Um, yes. But uh, it, it is interesting. So it's, it's uh, you know, Jared's grandson is when we get... Um, his grandson is ruling, so it's his uh, great grandson that rebels, right? Um, so that's that's how many generations you get before you get some problems. Uh, but it, you do get this big overview of a society. It's kind of like I don't know if anyone's ever done this, where you try and read the whole Book of Mormon or listen to the whole Book of Mormon in a really short period of time. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of details you don't get, lots of the kind of the things that you don't get when you slow down and ponder. But there are some things you get by seeing that whole picture. And right. the Book of Ether allows us to do that. This is like reading the Book of Mormon super fast or listening to it at, at six times speed or something, right? So, right. Uh, and, and I wanted to spend a minute, if it's all right, just on the uh, the cycle that we see in here. And you you talked about it as like the the pride cycle. I think that's a good name for it. Um, it is very similar to the, that pride cycle we talked about in the Book of Mormon. I always like to talk about this in, in maybe even a, a bigger picture view, not just to call it the pride cycle, but uh, I call it the covenant or covenant corruption cycle. Okay. Uh, and uh, because I think we see it in all books of Scripture, it, it isn't always necessarily the same kind of pride that we see in the Book of Mormon, where it's often about costly apparel and adorning yourselves with things that, that don't live and and wealth and so on. Sometimes it's idolatry, but that's idolatry, but it's idolatry of a different form in the Old Testament and so on. Um, and I should note that the Jaredites certainly don't hold what we call the Abrahamic covenant, because this is before Abraham is born. But remember, the Abrahamic covenant is the new and everlasting covenant that was established with um, Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. And I would be really shocked if uh, Jared and his brother uh, aren't covenant holders. And so I, th I think the covenant would still apply to them. Uh, and in my mind, what happens is that you appeal, you're, you're righteous, and so you appeal to God through the covenant, and he blesses you, and you start to enjoy those blessings, and then something happens that makes you think that those blessings are because of uh, you. Uh, or you start to focus on worldly things, and that makes it so you stop keeping your covenant, and then God humbles you to remind you of your covenant and bring him, bring you back to him. And when you're right. humbled, then you start to keep the covenant blessings and so on. And we see that cycle happen again and again and again in the book of Ether in, in very quick format. So uh, I would say that, that you probably will see it at six times in just uh, like 10 chapters. Uh, that where they just whip through this again and again and again and again, uh, and we're we're starting the first one uh, now. Uh, it's in chapter seven that we see that. Well, I mean, we started it with the 
the beginning in, in Ether chapter one. That's when they're turning to God and keeping their covenant and then getting blessings. Right. And we just read about the prospering in chapter six. And it's here in chapter uh, seven that we get the uh, the turning away from the covenant and being humbled. Um, and so I, I thought that it, it might be worth kind of going through each of these cycles. So I'm going to say the first one is from chapter one through pretty much the end of chapter seven, but chapter seven, verse 25. Uh, and maybe we could uh, list some of the key lessons that come from those cycles, and then we can talk about anything in particular that we want to talk about in those cycles is, is one way I thought we could maybe do this. Okay. That sounds so, good. Uh, here are some of the lessons that I, I listed, um, and we've talked about them a little bit already, uh, that, that uh, lust for power or lust for things – uh, lust for fame, th th that kind of thing, right? And they're usually all interconnected. It, that kind of lust will always corrupt and bring misery. When you're focused on you and what you want, it will inevitably bring misery. What were the were the ones that the, 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 was it four P's that President Nelson said? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, power, popularity, possessions, and pleasure of the flesh. Right, yeah. Yeah, and that's Those exactly things. what we see going on here. 100%. President Nelson really put it succinctly. Those things, when you when those things come into play, you know you're in trouble. When any of those get out of balance, you know, of course we want to have um, a fun time and we're made to, to be a joyful people, right? Yeah. But when pleasure gets out of control or, or you know, of course we need leaders, but when power gets out of control or, right. you know. And of course we need a couple of possessions. Sure. Yeah. It's nice to have a chair to sit in and things like that. <laughs> well, do um, you remember uh, um, George Durant? He was my yeah. mission president, and you uh, he was uh, also a colleague of yours at... at uh, yeah, and he, he was for me as well, for both of us while we were in the MTC. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. And, and he used to say, you know, as a teacher, you're not going to have a boat, but you can always have a friend with a boat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, that's right. <laughs> someone needs to have a boat. Yeah. I don't know, because you need a water ski. But anyway... But you're right. So we need some possessions. But again, when those things get out of balance, of course, the Lord wants us to have some of that. But when when our hearts become focused on that or that becomes the main drive, then we're in trouble. That's when yeah. you have have crossed over the Rubicon and you're you're uh, you're in you're in bad shape. Yeah. And it's if we can learn from President uh, Nelson on this. And I, I will say that I think that's one of the lessons we learn in each of these cycles, that listening to prophets is key to avoiding the problems. You if, you have to listen to the prophets. When you don't, you have the problems. When you do, Agreed. you can get out of the problems. And uh, President Nelson is telling us, when you start to think that your happiness is going to come from the power or from the popularity or the possessions or the pleasures of the flesh, when you start to think that's going to make you happy, that's when you've got a problem because they are incapable of delivering that. It's God that can give that to you. And so you need to have God first, not those things first. And that that perspective will solve this problem. Amen to that. That's a great way to put that. Yeah. And I, I just a couple other lessons I have from this. Mm -hmm. We've talked about one already. Uh, leaders can do a lot of good or they can do a lot of bad. Uh, oh, for sure. And I think we... When we hear that, we think political leaders, but and and that's that's uh, important. But I think even more important are what I would call thought leaders, the the people who we are listening to uh, or reading, or even we may not think of them as thought leaders, but the people who make movies or songs become thought leaders. Oh yeah, uh, or write books. It, it, it will affect you, and and so we have to be careful of that. I think. Well, everybody's looking for the celebrity endorsement. That just shows yeah. that, that 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 that's we see them as leaders in some way. Yep. So yeah. and and what a what a weird way to choose someone who you'll allow to influence you because they can write exciting um, uh, screenplays or they can act as a, an exciting person on that in that screenplay. Right. Uh, that's that's not good criteria for who should influence your thoughts, but that's what we do so often anyway. Uh, so I, I think we need to pay more attention to that. Uh, and uh, the last lesson, and then we can kind of look at any specifics we want in here, but the last lesson I drew from this is that sincere repentance is is necessary and makes a powerful difference. We really have to take our daily repentance seriously. Uh, yeah, agreed. And before you move off the, the power part, um, it reminds me, one of my 
key scriptures that I use all the time is uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 121 about the priesthood. It's at the end of there, and it's, it goes all the way from 34 to 46. Mm -hmm. But one of my favorite ones is, we've learned by sad experience that it's the nature and disposition of almost all men, as soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. Hence, yeah. many are called and few are chosen. And here's the key. No power or influence can or ought be maintained by virtue of the priesthoods. So we're talking about priesthood leaders now. But this could also apply to to uh, to political leaders or any other kind of leader. But uh, no power or influence ought be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge, yeah. which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile. So let's contrast that because we're going to get into the secret combinations here in just a minute before we wrap up. Contrast what it says there with the secret combinations, and then we're going to draw a distinction between what's a secret combination and what's just a sacred secret or what's, you know, an alliance or whatever. There's nothing wrong with alliances and, and, and you know, those kind of things uh, when, you, when you get together in groups. It's when you cross over into things that are opposite of that then you have a problem with uh, with the power getting out of control, like you were mentioning a little bit earlier there. So anyway, yeah. I, I wanted to mention that uh, the documents come to section 121 because that's that's one of the key things in my life that I, I think that is, is very instructive for both leaders in the church and outside. You don't have to have the priesthood to, to be a leader, but if you're if you're trying to control people by compulsion or those kind of things, then it's contrary to the, the economy of God and you're going to be, you're going to be anti freedom. Yeah. So there you go. And, and, and anti joy. Anti joy. Uh, oh yeah. And, it doesn't because it's anti godliness, right? It's it, right. It, the, the nature of God is congruent with the nature of happiness. We learned this in, in Alma 41. And uh, the, if you're not congruent with the nature of uh, godliness, then you, uh, cannot be congruent with the nature of joy or happiness. So no, you will eventually have a problem with freedom you, yep. because it will impinge on that. So you can't have a system that is based on control or compulsion. So okay, absolutely. Well, and I, I think uh, yeah. that will come out really strongly as we get moving to chapter eight with the the um, secret combinations that you're talking about. But but before we go there, if it's all right, maybe mm -hmm. we can just highlight some of what we were talking about with the repentance and the the um, prophets that we get right at the end of chapter seven, when they start to come out of the bad part of this cycle and into a better part. Um, mm -hmm. So we get, uh, we get in verse 22, we've got Kohor has a son named Nimrod and Nimrod gives up the kingdom of Kohor unto Shul. So we get it back to this righteous King and uh, the reign of Shul, in the reign of Shul, there came prophets among the people who were sent from the Lord prophesying that the wickedness and idolatry of the people was bringing a curse upon the land. And people start to be bad to the prophets, but Shul executes a law saying you can't be bad to the prophets and, and gives the prophets the chance to preach. And when they preach, then we get um, the end of verse 25. And by this cause, well, let's read all of 25. He did execute a law throughout all the land, which gave power unto the prophets that they should go whithersoever they would. And by this cause, the people were brought under repentance. Mm -hmm. and because the people did repent of their iniquities and idolatries, the Lord did spare them, and they began to prosper again in the land. Now, that's that's the, the place where we want to be, where we are listening to prophets. If you listen to prophets, you will repent. It turns out they often tell you to repent. And so um, <laughs> if you listen to prophets, you'll repent, and then you'll have peace and happiness and joy and prosperity, all the blessings of the covenant. And I, I just love those couple lines there that highlight it perfectly. That's we're we're all going to go through this cycle to some degree. The way to get out of the bottom part when we're there, and the way to try and stay out of it, is by listening to the prophets and repenting daily. Amen. That's awesome. That's perfect. That's a, that's exactly what we're looking for. But now we get and, the wild ride of chapter eight. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I was going to say that's the that's the big picture we're talking about. But that also applies on the smaller level, like you were saying, daily repentance. So what about our daily battles? What are we doing to overcome our daily battles? We all get beset by something beset. Well, that's how much I read the scripture, beset. Who, who uses that word? But anyway, yeah. we're all put off by by our own 
misdeeds and whatever, but let's do that daily. Okay, good. So chapter eight, let's move along. Yeah. So we're, we're now in this kind of second cycle, which in some ways depends on where you want to divide it, but in some ways it starts in verse 26. This is where you're, you're doing well and so on. And it's going to go all the way to, to chapter nine, somewhere around one or 12 or something like that, depending on how you want to divide it. But the bulk of it is chapter eight and chapter eight is uh, one of the worst chapters in all of scripture in that I don't and by that I don't mean you shouldn't read it but I mean this is where you read in detail of the birth of secret combinations that will lead to the destruction of a nature uh, of a nation I mean uh, it, it's one of kind of some uh, Moses 5 uh, Helaman 3 and ether 8 are the three places where you can learn about the problems with secret combinations more than just about anywhere else and so it's a, it's a depressing chapter in a lot of ways yes yeah, it is. It, it, yeah, and sometimes we need the depressing ones to remind us that there's what to stay away from. So yeah, yeah go ahead and kick that off. And I'm gonna I'm gonna mention something here in a minute. But go ahead and start us off with that. And then I, I have a, a, a an interesting observation here. All right. Well, I'm just gonna say I, I think as you read Ether eight or Moses five or it, really the whole book of Helaman, what you see is that it is a desire for power that starts. Power and gain. Those are the two things that are associated with secret combinations. People want more power and they want more more possessions. Uh, so there we are with what President Nelson has, has talked to us about. Uh, they are they want it so badly that they're willing to deal with Satan to get it. And I think sometimes people realize, like it's clear that Cain knew he was dealing with Satan. I'm not sure if everyone who gets involved knows they're dealing with Satan, but in reality. Once you start seeking for power and possessions in a way that that you have disregard for the laws of God, you're dealing with Satan. That's that's who you're making your deals with. Yeah, you're on his territory then. That's exactly right. You, that's <laughs> right. You've left you've left God's side of the field, and you're on Satan's, <laughs> and and that's not a good place to be. Uh, and I would suggest that there is not anyone listening who doesn't struggle at least a little bit with wanting power and possessions. Uh, I, I think we all do. And uh, so th we need to learn these lessons and, and look for it in ourselves or else we won't be okay. And you see um, Moroni, uh, even at the end of this chapter, if I remember right, isn't it at the end of chapter eight? Yeah. You yeah. see Moroni, I, my feeling is he's almost panicked as he's talking about this. Uh, warning us. So maybe it's at the end of the chapter, but it might be worth talking about now. So we pay more attention to what we're going to talk about in the chapter. Right. Where, yes. Where Moroni says uh, that you need to wake up to your awful situation. Uh, and uh, he says it, at the end, at the very end, verse 26, I'm Moroni, I'm commanded to write these things that evil may be done away. Um, but he is he's he's telling us wake up and pay attention uh verse 24 wherefore the lord God commanded you when you shall see these things come among you you shall awake to your a sense of your awful situation because of this secret combination which which shall be among you right it's not which maybe might pop up a little bit it will <laughs> be among you or woe be unto it because of the blood of them who have been slain Right. He is really serious about this. In verse 25, he tells us it's going to seek to overthrow the freedom of all lands and nations and countries. Well, I, I have this double underlined in my paper scriptures, and I have it blocked out here. And I have, I, I've had this in my um, my scriptures for years and years. Um, when I was uh, when I was at BYU, I was studying a lot about uh, about government and about um, uh, the constitution and all that kind of thing. And, and I remember when I first got off my mission, I went to brother Johnson's class and he was talking about this verse and he, what you mentioned in verse 24, he says, when ye shall see these things come among you, shall, you shall awake to your, your sense of your awful situation. And like you just mentioned, he doesn't say if he says, when this happens, now this is Moroni editorializing and he's saying, look, this happened to the Jaredites. It just happened to his own people. The yeah, he saw robbers. how this ends. Yeah, right. oh yeah. His own people were just destroyed by the beginnings of the Gideon robbers and Kishkamen and all those all those people who stabbed and got gain and all the things that we've been talking about for the last few months. He just saw his own people. He now inserts the record of Jared, which is 
in large part from six from the from well from verse uh, from from ether eight on is about secret combinations and how it destroys the people. And then he says, now who's he talking to? He's talking to us. He says, yeah, very when specifically, see, very specifically, when you shall see these things that you wake your off situation. So he's talking to us now. And I have a note in here that I've had. Um, and what, back when I had a Franklin planner, back when before the digital age, I had a Franklin planner and my brother and I would get together. My brother's a great guy. And he, he would, he would, we would reduce these, uh, these talks you know, on the copier and reduce them, reduce them, reduce them at work until we could get them small enough to, to uh, punch and, and put in the back of our Franklin planner. And I kept several different talks from President Benson. And this is one of my talks. It's called I Testify. And it's from October 1988. So um, I would keep this in there and I'm going to read a part from that this section. So um, the, it's called I Testify because every paragraph, almost every paragraph in this whole thing says, I testify, I testify, I testify, I testify. And about, oh, I don't know, halfway down, maybe a third of the way down in President Benson's talk, he says, I testify, oh, wait, oh, let me see, That's I testify that Christ is born in mortality, that's not what I'm looking for. Um, I, uh, I testify the Book of Mormon, I testify that America is a choice land. God has raised up from the founding fathers of the United States of America and established an inspired constitution. Um, this was a required prologue of restoration of the gospel. That's interesting. It's a required prologue for the restoration of the gospel. America will be a blessed land and righteous forever. And now remember, this is, we're, we're talking. That's where the Jaredites were and the and the and uh, the Nephites talking about the same area. Now it may not be exactly the United States of America, but it's this continent that was a choice land. Um, and then he says, America will be a blessed land and righteous forever and is the ba- uh, as a blessed land unto the righteous forever and is the base from which God will continue to direct his worldwide Latter-day operations of his kingdom. Now, this is the key for, for this particular section. I testify that wickedness is rapidly expanding in every sec- segment of our society. It is more highly organized, more cleverly disguised, and more powerfully promoted than ever before. Secret combinations lusting for power, gain, and glory are flourishing. A secret combination that seeks to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries is increasing in its evil influence and control over America and the entire world. And then after that, it says Ether 18 through 25 in in the conference talk that has a little footnote there. So... The prophets are not joking around here. Yeah. No, that's that's Mor- a pretty serious warning. Yeah. Moroni puts this in there and he says, when you shall see, when, 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 when you shall see. And then President Benson says that there is now a combination that's seeking for a listener. And he, he says there's many, but the, the, he also says a secret combination. So I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's, is it specific? Is it more of a general thing? I'm not going to try to read in, into the that exactly what that means, but what does it mean for us? How do we find this out? How do we keep ourselves safe from this? And how do we end up on the right side of that field? If we don't want to be in Satan's territory, how do we end up in God's territory? So, Kerry, what do we do? Well, I, I, that's a great question. And I, I think, I mean, it's easy to just pass by this and say, I'm not going to worry about it, I'm not going to worry about it. I, I don't think that's a safe place to be. But Moroni is telling us, no, get get your eyes open. Be looking and be ready and try and do something about this. So, I mean, some of it's going to have to be uh, calling out wickedness when we see it and trying to, Mm -hmm. you know, help our society be more righteous. But I I think there are a couple of other things that are worth uh, thinking about. One of those is, um, as we just talked about, continually watching yourself to see, are you doing things uh, because you want power or possessions? Or are you involved with people who are doing things because they want power or possessions? That's always a red flag. That should just send alarm bells. Anytime you start to think, oh, look at what I'm doing. Uh, what, are, what are my primary motives? Is my primary motive uh, I'm a God prevailing in my life or is it uh, this other? That, that You just have to wake up at that moment. And that's what Moroni is asking you to do. But, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no I'm just going to say you're exactly right. That's, we, we, we kind of already touched on it. Um, the Lord does want us to have some things, but when we, when we are, when these, now in verse eight, when you talk about them bringing forth these things, this is interesting. Mormon, or excuse me, Moroni says 
that um, he he brings up these things that are that are there. There's a these people read about them in the daughter of Akish, I believe it is. Um, the daughter of Akish says, "Hey, weren't there some records that tell about this?" And I'm wondering where they got this information. Yeah, yeah, I mean, me too. Uh, um, was, was this hidden just, in a special part of the boat? I don't know. Yeah. yeah, and 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 Mormon says, "Hey, it's had among all the people." So, <laughs> so was it just part of the things that were in there? Now Moroni is purposeful and leaves out. He says, "I'm not going to write these down." He doesn't write down what they are, but there is something in there that has to do. I don't know if it's plans. I don't know if it's, I don't know what it is. And I don't know that I really want to know what it is. It's interesting yeah. to me in a, in a, in, in some kind of way, but it's really, um, it says in verse 18, it came to pass, they formed a secret combination, even as they of old, which combination is most abominable and wicked. Now that sounds specific to me. Yeah. Mormon, my, my guess is this is uh, some, some of their scriptures, and it's just an account. I, I don't know if it has the details. If I had to guess, it's the account of what happens with Cain and Satan, and then sure. the things that go forward from there. Yeah, there. I mean, I know that that the uh, you know the the Sicilian mafia they had particular things, and there's there's things that you would say when you join the mafia that you would that you would take an oath, and I don't know what's specific, but. Um, uh, but the Lord, but here in verse 18, it came secret combination of the day of old. And then 19, for the Lord worketh not in secret combinations. Now, this is different from having sacred. Now, we right. talk about things being secret versus sacred. Well, the temple, we do have secret things. They are sacred, but they are they they fit the definition of secret. But it's not because we're trying to get power. There's nothing about power, gain, influence like that. Nothing in the temple gives you that right. or is even aimed anywhere near that. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. It's about service, 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 service. It's always serving. It's looking outward. It's not getting it for yourself. And that's the difference. So when you're trying to serve yourself when you, or, or your little group, your band, or get power, influence, like it says over here in, in, uh, in Doctrine and Covenants, uh, to gain influence um, over others, then you're on the Satan's territory side. So in verse 19, for the Lord work not see combinations, neither uh, doth he... Uh, Neither doth he that a man... Okay, let me read that again. Will that a man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Doth he will that a man should shed blood. So again, it has to do with shedding of blood and, you know, killing people there. But all things hath he forbidden from the beginning of man. And now I'm reminded, do not write the manner of their oaths and combinations. So there was something specific there. I'm not going to write the manner and the com- of their combinations. But it may be known that they are among all people, and they're had among the Lamanites. And they have uh, caused the destruction of this people whom I am now speaking and the destruction of the people of Nephi. So he says he destroyed the people talking about the Jaredites here and the people of Nephi, his people. Yeah. That's what caused their destruction was a secret combinations yeah. and playing on the, the, on Satan's team. So this is something that you can't ignore because it's going to come looking for you. Yeah. And I would say it's the it's, it's secret combinations are the satanic imitation of covenants. And uh, yeah, exactly. And that's why you know th- we do covenants and temples and so on. So it's it's just it's the ter- it's the imitation that appeals to the natural man in us, whereas covenants and the temple ordinances are appealing to the divine side in us. And well, so it's again it's just which whose whose field are you on? Hundred percent. And I remember back. I mean, my uh, my Sunday school classes and my seminary. I remember them talking about. The Lord has covenants, and Satan has the counterfeit. Everything he does is a counterfeit. It's similar to, yeah. but not the same. So yeah. where we have um, temple ceremonies and things like that that are sacred to us, and that we we make covenants, he has the opposite. He has secret oaths. So covenants is on the is on the Lord's side. Secret oaths is on the man and on Satan's side. Yeah. Covenants, oaths. You know, you have freedom. and So anyway, you can go down the list of all the different counterfeits that the Satan will do for you. But watch out for that. And in fact, that reminds me of um, this is where it becomes confusing in our day. So how do we know the difference? Well, you've got to stick close to the Lord and you've got to stay in these scriptures. So Isaiah uh, chapter 5, verse 20, one of them who call good evil and evil good that put a darkness for light and light for darkness and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is where I find... The problem with our society. Where do you go for truth? Yeah. 
where do we go for truth? Well, Google. The, that's where people go for truth. But that's <laughs> that's not where truth is to be found. But yeah, <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, that's going to give you. You can do a Google search and you can find lots of. But it's not, Google, uh, Chat GPT. They're not going to tell you what's good. They're, they have information. They don't have wisdom. Yeah, we've got to be in the scriptures to find wisdom. Stick close to the Spirit of the Lord to determine what is good, evil for good. We just had an election here. Half the country's mad. Half the country's happy. Do we make a good choice or make a bad choice? Well, stick to the Lord. What is the Lord telling you on those things? And, you know, vote your conscience, support good people the best you can, and stay close to the prophets, what the prophets and the, and the scriptures tell us, and the spirit and your personal revelation. That's how you know good from evil. That's not a super easy thing to do in, in this society. I think we have a lot of things, good for evil, evil for good, bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. It's tough. Yeah. So we've got to protect ourselves. Well, and you touched on something that I, I wanted to mention. I think it's our other great key for uh, be wearing uh, and, and dealing with secret combinations and knowing how to deal with them. Uh, maybe we can do it. I, I'm like you. Like, I don't want to say, okay, uh, this is a secret combination. That's a secret combination. And so and I, I don't want to get into all of that. Um, but I, I, maybe I can use as an example something that I think that most people agree is a secret combination. And that's that's gangs. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think most people would agree that they are a kind of secret combination and they, they, oh, yeah. they want power. They want, then they deal in bloodshed and that kind of a sure. thing, right? Uh, the other thing I think most people who study gangs would agree on is that, that gangs serve as a kind of a surrogate family that really, this is where people go to belong because they're not getting the belonging they need in a family. That's um, right. It's not, not, and that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone who's in a gang, their family was dysfunctional or they had a bad mother or something like that, but just right. circumstances or whatever, it becomes that. So that for the most part, for most people, they're surrogate families. And I find that interesting. If you look historically, gangs have been around for a long time, but probably hit the uh, the heyday of, of craziness in the 80s. Um, there's still all sorts of gang problems now, but the eighties were really crazy. And I, I served my mission in Southern California. I, I, I saw some of this firsthand. Oh yeah. Um, the Crips and the Bloods, all that was happening, that yeah. big fights. Yeah. 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 I was in a town once where we knew we, we shouldn't wear red ties or blue ties in this part of town <laughs> or that part. It's just dangerous. Right. So, yeah. um, so the, it's interesting stuff, but, uh, it's interesting to me that if you look at what the church is doing, in the 70s, you're getting this huge push on family home evening and on mm -hmm. families and so on. And I have to think that if the world had listened to that, and I'm not saying that everyone uh, who had problems with their kids in gangs didn't do that because it doesn't work that way. We can do all the right, right. things and still have problems. But if the world had listened to that, uh, then I have to think that we wouldn't have had that kind of problem with gangs. If they That's just right. listened to what the prophets were saying, then that secret combination wouldn't have gotten the traction that it got. And and to me, that highlights, uh, and this is not new to even what we've already been saying today, but it highlights if you want to know what to do to be prepared for secret combinations, listen to the prophets. And my guess is that we don't even, they probably don't even know when they're speaking in general conference, okay, I need to say this so that people will know how, how to be prepared for when a different secret combination comes up. They just know they need to say that. Uh, and you're ignoring any of it at your own peril because you don't know which uh, which of those things are what you need to be doing in your family to ha have you protected from secret combinations and ready to deal with them as uh, they, they come into your life in one way or another or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Following the prophets are the great key to dealing with these things, I believe. Oh, yeah. This is one of the, the great things about the church and having living prophets that are not just interpreting scripture, but their 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 task is and they have the authority to um, to give us uh, instruction and 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 show, you know, that's why we I, that's why I love General Conference twice a year. It's great to get some new instruction. And, and even though it's not new, it's just we're reemphasizing this or right now we have this. And this is why I like President uh, Benson's talk where he says, I testify these things. It's such a powerful talk. You really should read that. October yeah. 1988, uh, it's called I Testify. So, um, perfect. Yeah, th I agree with you, Gary. And, and uh, it becomes tough to see what's going on, but we gotta, we have to um, 
We have to follow those, the, the prophets and listen to what they're saying. It's interesting you mentioned gangs because I've read a lot of the literature and, and seen a lot of um, psychologists talk about the people. Uh, they've done a lot of interviews with gang members, former gang members, and so forth, people in prison. And a lot of it has to do with the absence of fathers in the home. Mm-hmm. A lot of times they'll they'll respect their mother to a degree, but the fathers in the home missing is one of the, the key things that keeps yeah. these tends to be male. I mean, by an overwhelming majority, not just tens, but it's overwhelming majority. Mm-hmm. The males who don't have a strong father figure um, in the home that's, uh, you know, leading co- correct principle, at least they tend to go, they'll, they'll find it elsewhere. Yeah. Now women in, in having have also been in the gangs and there's more and more of those all the time, but, but it's, it, you're right. It's the correct principle in the home. Anyway, yeah. you mentioned that. So good. Excellent. Well, we're, we're starting to get short on time. Maybe I can just kind of, I'd love to just read some of the things we've talked about, but I just want to highlight some of the things that I, I wrote down that we can learn from that. Uh, and then maybe we can hit it on a couple of the other cycles and then, then we'll have to wrap up. But yeah. Uh, I've got down for this particular cycle, Satan exploits lust for power and pride to bring about our captivity and much misery. And I think we don't recognize it that way, but it's true. When you have a lust for power or pride, Satan wants to exploit it. And what he wants to do with it is make you misery, miserable. And as you said, take away freedom. Right. Uh, then we've already talked about there's a danger. Secret combinations are real and dangerous and prophets help warn of secret combinations. The, the last one I have is secret combinations inevitably bring great misery and destruction. And I think we we sometimes don't pay attention to that either. Right. Well, and heck, Moroni says, this is why my these two people, these people and my people were destroyed, was because of secret combinations. And in a broader sense, you can say that any kind of sin is a secret combination in a way. But yeah. particularly, sin you can deal with on an individual basis. There's ways to repent. But when you get an underground secret combination where people are dedicated bound to and and swearing oaths and things like that when you have a people just like the same thing like when you have a government uh, a government can be very powerful for a very powerful force for good because you're organizing people to do things of importance like you know build roads and cities and 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 strengthen um communities that's what the that's what the 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 proper role of government is but when it becomes a cabal or when it becomes a, a, a combination, a group of people that are trying to get gain from themselves or whatever they're trying to do, then it becomes a secret combination and you're working against freedom. And gospel principles cannot flourish in um, oppressive regimes, whatever yeah. that might be. So, Amen. well, that's our takeaway. That's one of my takeaways from this one is that, you know, awake your awful situation. So are we in an awful situation? But let's be joyful about the journey. It doesn't mean we have to be, was it right. President Kimball who called it, um, I think it's President Kimball. It said, we don't want to walk around pickle suckers, <laughs> you know, like, oh, the world's terrible. And, you know, I know yeah. some of those people that it's, oh, the, oh man, any minute we're going to, the, 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 it's terrible. The thing, oh, man. The, okay. I, I like I like Moroni's warning, but I also like that in Moroni, in the end of uh, in the Mormon, um, the book of uh, the book of Mormon in the Book of Mormon talks about that they're like, hey, look, we're just going to keep going on. We're going to be the, the cheerful warriors. We know that we're yeah. that you know our people are doomed, but we're going to be cheerful. And Moroni is trying to help us out here. Look, um, we'll be into you because of the the blood cries from the earth. So don't go this. Come to pass. Who shall build up these things? shall overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries. So he's trying to help us out. So let's listen yeah. to his warning. Let's let's support good principle. Let's work on good principle, and let's strengthen our families against it. And, and I think some of the joy that can be part of this is highlighted in the next cycle more than it was in the last one. The last one that, that isn't just the worst. Uh, but this next one, which I think goes from the beginning of chapter 9 to, through about verse 34 of chapter 9, um, here are some of the things I think we can see in there. First of all, it, it emphasizes that Satan and the world can never deliver on their promises. They promise you things that they can't do. And that, that reminds me of that talk by President Nelson where he said, you know, uh, you seek for power, popularity, possessions, and pleasures of the flesh, but they mm-hmm. will not bring you peace. They cannot. They're incapable of it. Uh, in contrast, God does deliver his people. He makes good on his promises, and he does deliver his people. And when people are righteous, then you can get righteous men like Emmer who can see the Lord. And, and in one way or the other, we can all see the Lord's hand in our lives. 
uh, the, so it's a strong contrast in this one. You've got people who are following Satan, who are just being brought into captivity and God bringing righteous people into wonderful places uh, because uh, this is my fourth one on this one, that prophets uh, always warn the people. And if you listen to them, then you get that deliverance and, and help from God. And and the fifth point I have from this one is the Lord will do whatever is necessary to get his people to repent. Now, that can be tough. That 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 means humbling. Right. And that can be tough. But it it's to move you to a good place so that you can, again, have the the deliverance and the blessings and the peace and prosperity that God promises you. I got nothing to add except for amen or that that's. That's perfectly said. Unfortunately, we're going to kind of end on on uh, in the middle. Chapter 11, we're still, chapters uh, 9, 10, 11 is wars. And it just, it goes like, again, yeah. your Looney Tunes thing where you're saying it just goes person after person. And there's a, here's a slight thing. I'll make this a very quick side note. But did you, have you ever noticed how many people uh, grow up in captivity? Yeah, yeah. They don't. They don't. Not just grow up. There's some of them that just live their entire lives in captivity. Well, there's like six generations. Yeah. That live in entire. That they lived all their. It says they lived all their days in captivity. It's uh. Yeah. It's in chapter eight. Reign of Omar was in captivity half of his days, um, and then it goes on there. Uh, I think maybe it might be in chapter nine, but there's there's six generations that grew up in captivity. Now this is something you that you don't. I, I, this is something that belongs to um, uh, people in antiquity, and the uh, the the people in um, in England had this. Like when they had the Plantagenets, man, I, I'm drawing a blank on some of the uh, my history there. But you have, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the Plantagenets is one group, but they will they had a split uh, basically in in the monarchy. And then one side will imprison the other side, and they, they don't kill the kings, yeah. and they don't kill the the princes. They just live in captivity. Yeah. And these these princes, these people here, obviously they were able to marry, so they were in captivity in some way. Now they're enslaved in some way, maybe I don't know. They're able to to marry, and they but they don't kill them. They they're alive, but they remain in captivity their whole lives, and six generations in a row before yeah. they're released. And then, anyway, so in the comment sections, if you uh, if you're following along at home, put in the comment sections if you know anything about this this uh, this kind of. Uh, I think it's maybe a, a respect. I don't know what it is. It's kind of an honor code among yeah. among people that they'll do nasty stuff to you, but they won't kill you. They'll keep you in captivity. Sometimes starve you to death, but yeah. they uh, they do have some respect uh, for the. For the for the lineage of the king. So anyway, yeah, there's note. often a fear that uh, you get divine punishment if you uh, strike down the the royal right. blood, like, and exactly. so you, it, it, whether it's a superstition or a, a righteous belief, I don't know. But uh, but it does often make it so you get, and it seems to us a very odd situation. It's different than in the Old Testament. You get all the time like, no, we are wiping out every male heir. Oh yeah, so that you have that no, too. Yeah, but uh, but here. Uh, and to me, this is great evidence that uh, Joseph Smith is not making this up, because if you're making stuff up, you try and make it like the Old Testament, and you don't get this at all in the Old Testament. But uh, you do get it in lots of different cultures. And yeah. uh, it, it, I, I can't imagine what it's like to be generations in captivity, whatever that captivity looks like. Do they have like a little how, you know plantation that they all live on or something? I don't know. But <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, what a crazy thing. And it certainly, th this highlights the fulfillment of prophecy from the brother of Jared who said, this thing leads to captivity, right? The, this kingship thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It led to plenty and plenty and plenty of captivity. Oh. We see it in this record. Yeah. Look at this. I mean, there's, there's, uh, and I, I don't know how long this is because he doesn't, there's no timeline in the book of Ether, really, because yeah. we don't know where it stops and where it ends. This so we don't know the generation since the rule of this king or something like that. We don't get yeah, any of that. I, yeah. Like the, they must have had great uh, records in the reign of the judges because reign of the judges, like it's been 15 years, it's been 12 years, it's been, yeah. they have specific things. There's no timelines here. So we don't know how long, but some of these people live long. One, uh, was it one that's 140? 140 years old is what yeah, they said. I, I think mean, that's there's right. one that's yeah, 100, yeah. 102. It's in verse, it's in chapter nine. I think um, there's someone that's 140. 140. And I was like, is that a real number? Is that just kind of like one of those numbers that you just like a ripe old age, 120, you know, I don't yeah. know. But um, 
uh, and, uh, in chapter 10, verse 4, and Shez did live to an exceedingly old age. Um, so um, I, we don't know how long this is, is my point. I, I, but generations after generations, and that's your alluding to things. It just, it just, this one then uh, lived in, in captivity, and this one was, was killed. And this, it's terrible for, and it goes on for, it has to be hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. I mean, if, if you just figure to some of these people, it, there, there's hundreds of years of just constant strife and being spit by the hand of the robber and he's exceedingly rich. And then this piece is, it's just terrible. Um, I mean, maybe there's good stuff in there. In fact, if you read the, the, uh, is it chapter, chapter 10, um, the verse, the, the chapter heading, it just says one King succeeds another. Some of the Kings are righteous. Others are wicked. When yeah. righteousness prevails, the Kings are, or the people are blessed and, and prospered by the Lord. Uh, that's about all you can do for this, all of chapter 10. That's, yeah. it's just one big, he passed away and this guy died and this is good and this guy's bad. Now I didn't, but, I'm going to, I'm going to spring a surprise on you here, Lamar. Okay. Do uh, it. And you can, you can juke out of it if you want, but <laughs> uh, we, we need to wrap up, but I, uh, since president, since general conference and president Nelson said that we should uh, each week study the uh, atoning sacrifice of Christ, I mm -hmm. am uh, trying to make sure we have at least something about that on the podcast uh, each week. So we've got all the Looney Tunes stuff going on. What do you see in here that helps you better understand the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Well, okay, this is an easy primary answer for me in the sense that when you turn back to the Lord, the keystone, the foundation is always Jesus Christ. Oh. And in fact... Um, We'll have to mention this on another one. There's some other people that are dis detractors of the Book of Mormon that say, hey, how can you name Christ? He's not, this is many hundreds or thousands of years before he's yeah. born. How, how do they mention Christ in there? And I only say to them, they knew that there was a Redeemer that would come. Yeah. And every time it's mentioned in there, Redeemer, and Moroni, in, in ether here, he interjects many times that they looked for their Redeemer and their Savior. And even though we name him Christ, obviously Joseph Smith knew who that was, and he puts the name of Christ in there, and I think that's fine. These people knew of a Redeemer that would come. And when they turn to him, they are prospered. And when they turn away from him, they don't. Yeah. And that's always the key. You know, we talked about that, you know, which side are you playing on? Well, are you on the side of Christ and freedom and... um covenants and uh, turning to him and looking for what his influence his his, um, his light when you're looking toward him it's, again the brazen serpent when you're looking toward that then you prosper when you look away from that you find yourself on the wrong side uh, so that's what I think I, it, I know it sounds like a primary answer but that's what there isn't really a simpler answer than that it's like when you are seeking the Lord when you're seeking Jesus when you're seeking his covenants, you you should you, you don't have any fear. You shouldn't fear. That's good. Yeah, and I'm I'm with you. Like uh, we see the results of repentance, and we see deliverance a number of times in this, and that's what the atoning sacrifice is about: is being able to repent and be delivered. And and as you said, then we don't have to fear. That's beautifully said. I I appreciate that very much. And I'd also like to invite our audience to um, to leave some comments about what are the major lessons they see there's th th again it's this rapid fire kind of format we're getting in these this middle section of the book of ether but i'd like to ask you either what did you learn about uh, christ's redeeming power or what did you what are, your, are the major takeaway lessons you get from this set of chapters uh, and I, i'll just tell you right now i'm going to steal from you and i'm going to use this in my classes with, when you have good comments so uh, but please do <laughs> Uh, leave a comment for us on what you're gaining from these chapters. I always love to see what are the big picture or little picture lessons that people get from these chapters because there are so many lessons. And, and we really do read them. We read all of those ones. I, every, I, I There are no comments I haven't. Yeah. The, the, in, and I'll, I'll, in the whole history of the podcast, there are no comments that I haven't read. I will attest that because he comments on them. I will comment all the ones that I'm in. Um, I don't comment all the ones I'm not in, but I will comment on all the ones. And if I miss anybody, 
please call me out on it. I'll, I'll go back and find your comment and we'll, we'll do it. But we re, the ones I've been in, we replied in all the comments mm -hmm. and, uh, and we really try to do that. And we're, we're not so big that we uh, can't do that, but we, it, it'd be great if you could share this with others around you and leave those comments. It, it does help us. And we get good conversations going and we do learn from it. And, and I, Carrie, you mentioned using it. I've, I've taken some sections straight out of there and said, I'm going to, I'm going to use this. And I've, I've put notes in my scriptures that, Hey, this is a great comment or a good, yeah. you know, reference or whatever. So we learn from you. So please feel free or not feel free, feel obligated. Oh, no, I'm yeah. not. No, you should feel obligated. <laughs> I was, I was asked by the gen, well, last general Sunday school president to please have, uh, create discussions online using comments to, to have people interact with each other and, and have a discussion. That's what he wanted us to do. So I feel obligated. So I hope my audience will feel obligated. Okay. We'll, we'll feel obligated to tell you, yeah. um, you should feel, um, highly invited to leave a comment. Uh, by the way, I, I comment on the ones on YouTube. Are there other places, Carrie, that they can comment? I don't know any way on I don't Spotify. Know. There's there's a little bit on Spotify, but it's not very easy and not not uh, it doesn't happen very much. So YouTube is pretty much the place. So even if you're listening to this somewhere else, you can just hop on YouTube and leave a comment. Now it's also helpful to us uh, if when you hop on. So one of the things we actually get dinged a little bit in. Uh, the algorithm showing it to people if someone gets on and it looks like they listened for 10 seconds and then they got off. Uh, so when you hop on, uh, just if you want to mute it, whatever, let it play in the background and play all the way through. That actually helps it get shared so that more, pe more people see this. It does. Yeah, I listen a lot on Spotify because I do it while I'm running a lot. So yeah. when I'm listening to, to you or other podcasts too, but when I'm listening to the other guests, I'll listen to it on Spotify. But I go on to YouTube and I'll watch the episode through uh, sometimes and I'll get on there and I will comment and especially on the ones that, that, that I'm on, I will comment back on as many as I see. And I try to look through them diligently for at least a week or two while they're, you know, while yeah. it's relevant. So, um, yeah, anyway, that does help us a lot. Uh, I hope it helps you and Carrie, let's just wrap this up and say, uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today and, uh, we hope it's been helpful for you. Please share it with a friend, like subscribe that helps the podcast podcast grow and helps to get out to the people and again leave a comment yeah thank you all right see you next time <laughs>